Good morning. I greet you in the name of Christ on this Sunday, May 24th, Ascension Sunday, as well as Memorial Day weekend. Ascension is that transition between the Easter season and the season of Pentecost, the season of the celebrating the resurrected Christ and his life and transitioning to the Spirit. So Ascension, if I might remind you, is that dramatic departure of the risen Christ from his earthly bodily ministry 40 days after he has been resurrected from the dead. The apostles can no longer expect his physical presence. They must now wait for the promised coming of the Holy Spirit through whom Christ continues to do his work. As the Son now reigns with the Father in glory, and as we say in the Apostles' Creed, he ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father from when he will come the live, to judge the living and the dead. This morning's text is an ascension text, a surprising one in some ways, but it comes from the book of Ephesians, Paul's letter to the church in Ephesus. I want to focus just on two verses here. I want to savor these two verses this morning as we pray that indeed the Spirit will lift us up and help us to understand as well as stand under his word. Let us be attuned to his word this morning for us. Ephesians 1 verse 17 and 18, a prayer of the apostle Paul. He writes, I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you may know him better. I pray also that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints and his incomparably great power for us who believe. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God, indeed. Can you see it? Can you see it? I remember my dad saying those words to me as a young boy of about seven years old, standing in the front lawn of our house in Rockford, Illinois. He was pointing up to the heavens on a, on a moonless, dark night to see if I could make out the Big Dipper, the seven stars that make up the Big Dipper. And I I think I remember saying, yeah, I see it, but not really seeing it and not wanting my dad to be frustrated with me. But that question, can you see it? I struggled to connect the dots, as it were, those seven stars to make out something that could be called a, a, the Big Dipper. So it reminds me of the challenge that we have sometimes to see something that is real and, and larger than ourselves, how we have to train our eyes sometimes to see that larger vision. Do you remember in those of you who were alive in the 90s, those uh, 3D like calendars and pictures, you would have to train your eye in a certain way so that that flat two-dimensional piece of paper would open up into a three-dimensional figure. It was, it was magic. In fact, I, I think it was called the magic eye. And seeing with the magic eye was really pretty cool. It was almost like a miracle that that flat surface would become a three-dimensional figure. Can you see it? If you train your eye, you will be able to see it. Well, this morning, our scripture is focus is a vivid and memorable metaphor as Paul prays that the eyes of our heart may be enlightened. The eyes of our heart may be enlightened. What, what does that mean? What does that mean that Paul uses that phrase? Of course, for the Hebrews as well as the Greeks, the heart was not just an organ in the chest that pumps blood through the body, nor was it merely the seat of our emotions, but rather the heart is that deep place in our inner being where convictions are formed, where commitments are made, where virtues take root or not. There are many metaphors for the heart throughout the scriptures. Just one to highlight this is one of my favorites from Proverbs 4.23. It is written, above all else, guard your heart, for it is the wellspring of life. 
guard this heart, something deep and incredibly important is grown here. Be careful with it, the heart. Now you combine that, the heart with the eyes, right? The eyes are not merely organs for seeing either. They are a way, a metaphor for us perceiving what is true and what is good and what is beautiful. We, we often say there is more to life than meets the eye. And is that not true? There is more to life than meets the eye. There is a spiritual seeing beyond the natural seeing with our naked eye. And this is the wisdom and the revelation of God that can only come to us through the gift of the Spirit. And this wisdom of God is sometimes foolishness to humanity, but it is something that we are called to see and move towards and live into with the eyes of our heart enlightened. I have said often that we, we Christians believe in an unseen reality, an unseen reality that is more real and important and permanent than the visible reality that daily confronts our senses, as important as that reality is. And I'm not talking about having our head in the clouds, but being able to know deep in our heart to see what truly matters in life. It is sometimes beyond the naked eye. You know, the world often says seeing is believing. But is it possible? Paul seems to implicitly say that believing is seeing. Or as it says in the Gospel of John, I have written these things so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. Believing is seeing, or seeing is believing. Which one is it? One thing I know is that it is a struggle to see with the eyes of the heart enlightened in the world that we live in. It is a struggle. Some of you may remember at the end of Luke's gospel, the two followers of Christ that are on the road to Emmaus, seven miles from Jerusalem. And just that day, the tomb has been found empty after the crucifixion and burial of Jesus Christ. And as they're walking along and talking to each other about the day's events, a stranger comes up and joins them. Well, he's not a stranger. It is the risen Christ, but they don't recognize him. They are kept from recognizing him. And basically, Jesus says, hey, what's up? And they're like, are you new around here? You don't know all that has happened uh, to Jesus of Nazareth, a prophet, powerful in word and deed, and, and how our, our authorities handed him over to be crucified, but how today we heard from the women that he was not in the tomb. And, and, then, um, and then Jesus says to them, and they still don't recognize him, how slow of heart you are to believe. Did you not know he had to suffer these things? And he begins to give them a Bible study beginning with Moses. And, and the night comes and he's ready to walk on, but they invite him into the, their home and, and he breaks bread and then their eyes are opened and they are now seeing Jesus for who he really is. And then later, when he departs from them, they say, we're not our hearts burning within us, so that we have the burning hearts and the open eyes, that combination of eyes and heart, perceiving the truth about the reality of Jesus the Christ. But part of the reason I share that is because initially they missed it. They could not see him because they were weighed down with grief and shock and confusion and the truth is, often our hearts and minds are weighed down with responsibilities and tasks and the work that we have to live our daily lives. And in addition to that, quite frankly, our, our lives are cluttered, right, with, with possessions and distracted by ambitions and diversions and wants and, and worries and beset with our, our own sense of rights and importance, and we don't see as we ought to see. One of the concerns here is if that happens to us, we do not want to become like those that Jesus says, they are, they are ever hearing but not understanding. They are ever seeing but not perceiving. Jesus quotes the prophet Isaiah here. We do not want to become like those people who cannot see 
deeper spiritual truths because our hearts have become hardened and calloused. And so we no longer see and understand and we cannot turn to God and be healed and be made right and to have our eyes opened. We do not want to be ever seeing but not perceiving the truth about God and what God is doing even here and now. So Paul prays that you may have the eyes of your heart enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you. The hope, great big word again. You've heard me say that hope is not wishful thinking or vague fuzzy optimism. It is not seeing through rose-colored glasses. Rather, it is a deep-seated conviction, an anchor for the soul, a settled habit of heart that leads to Christ-like character. Oh, that you may see this hope, the riches of that inheritance for the saints. May you know this. May you experience it. May you trust it. May you lean into this. Of course, we cannot see this hope with the naked eye. As the Apostle Paul says elsewhere, hope that is seen is no hope at all, or we wouldn't call it hope. It is just without of our tangible reach. Rather, it is a deep assurance that God's promises are real and active and present with us here and now. Do we have the eyes to see it? Do you see this? In the season that we are in, that I need not belabor with more words, we all know it, we are all growing a bit weary. Do we have eyes to see the hope of Christ, the light of his face, and does it lead us to things daily that are helpful and loving? Do we see, do we know that truly God is our refuge and our strength and ever-present help in time of need? Do we see do we trust that we cannot prove beyond a shadow of a doubt that God is like a shepherd who directs us and leads us, yes, through green pastures, pleasant, but also through harrowing dark valleys? Can we see that Jesus is our highest hope for the richest kind of life, a spiritual life here and now? Can we see that? Can we connect the dots? May the eyes of your heart be enlightened so that you may know this hope and live a life worthy of the gospel, a life of worship and a life of service, a life of faith and a life of obedience. May it be so for you and for me. Let us pray. Gracious God, we do pray that the eyes of our heart may be enlightened. And Jesus, we give you thanks and praise for this beautiful season mid-May for the blooms and blossoms and birdsong. Praise be to you, God. And God, forgive us when life weighs us down heavy and we forget to look to you as our sovereign, as our source, as our Savior. Lift our eyes to see your goodness and light even in dark and difficult times, God. And Heavenly Father, on this Memorial Day weekend in this United States of America, we thank you for the blessings of liberty and security, that balance between those two. And for those who have given their last full measure of devotion for this nation, that it might continue and its ideals might continue to live. And for those, God, who continue to serve and protect and sacrifice their lives. Heavenly Father, few of us have seen firsthand the front lines of this battle with the virus. And so we continue to thank you for the servants of the sick and the dying. And God, for those of us who are wearying of laying low, God, grant us patience to bear necessary burdens. Grant us hope for a viable path forward for all. We pray this in the name of Jesus the Christ. Amen. <laughs>
And now I pray that God the Father give you a spirit of wisdom and revelation, that Jesus be made visible to you with the eyes of your heart enlightened. Go forth in joy and peace. Amen.